When I was considering an exit from medicine to health tech, one of the biggest uncertainties I had was around the granular detail of what a job in tech actually entailed. For example, what kind of job roles were there? What tasks would I be doing in each? What meetings would I be attending? What tools would I be using? And of course, what are the perks? And <clears throat> remuneration. I really wanted these questions answered so that I could make a judgement call for myself if I had the knowledge, skills and interest to do well at a job in tech and enjoy it. But no matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't find the detail to help me make this judgement. Today, I'm changing that to help you. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Shane and I'm a doctor, supervisor at Oxford University and manager at a multi-million health tech company. Today, I'm going to share with you what a typical month in my life as a manager at a multi-million health tech company looks like so that you can decide for yourself if a job in tech is suited for you. Now, let's kick off with some context. Firstly, I'll give you some context on the tech company that I work for, the departments within it and my particular job role. So, I work at a post-series A multi-million health tech company Company as a manager within the Department of Operations. If you're not fully familiar with some of these terms, then don't worry, neither was I at the beginning. Let me explain. Starting with a high level explanation of the term Series A. When a startup, i.e. early business, gets going, it requires a lot of money, aka capital, to start and grow. This capital or money can be gotten in many ways. One way is to sell their products and services and get that money organically. But another often faster route to generate this capital is to undertake various investment rounds, where investors give you some money in exchange for some equity, or also known as shares. The first investment round is often known as the seed round, then their series A, then B, and so on. Until the privately held company decides to go public through an IPO or initial public offering. Now, this is definitely an oversimplification and there are lots of caveats to this, so I'll link some articles below to give you a better, more detailed understanding. Anyway, in this case, the term multi-million post-series A signals that the startup is fairly well established and it's more of a scale-up at this point, where the business has gone from finding its feet to looking to spread its wings. To add further context, the startup, or now more of a scale-up that I work for, is called Dockler, a health tech company building the first and largest virtual hospital in Europe through the use of tech-enabled virtual wards powered by cutting-edge remote patient monitoring. Its business model is powerfully unique within the health tech space as it provides all aspects of remote patient monitoring, from software to hardware to logistics to CQC approved clinical monitoring. This gives back the NHS clinician their precious time, allowing them to do what they do best caring for patients. This powerful model does however mean that there are lots of moving parts to the business. The broad cogs are these. Strategy, which focuses on sales and business development. Operations, which include logistics, implementation, customer success and service. Clinical, which includes clinical monitoring from light touch all the way to CQC approved high level monitoring. And finally, but definitely not the least, tech which includes all the software and hardware that enables our service to be so powerful. So, as I mentioned, I work as a manager within operations. More specifically, I work as a manager in implementation and optimization. Very broadly, the purpose of my job role is to ensure that our product and service, in this case, remote patient monitoring and virtual wards, are implemented successfully and our clients maximize its use. Now, as the company has grown, I've moved into more of a strategy and growth role, where I'm working to grow the business through the optimization of delivery. Okay, so I've said a lot of words so far and you're probably losing faith that I'm going to deliver on my promise, which was to provide you enough detail about the day to day. So without further ado, this is what a typical month in my life looks like at a tech startup. This month is taken from my very own calendar with some minor modifications to protect some commercially sensitive information. Some weeks are a little busier and some are a little quieter, but this is a fairly average representation. Here are some key statistics for perspective. Typically, I spend three to four days a week working remotely from home with one to two days in our swanky offices in West London or with a client at their site. This is a good point to mention that Dockler has a very progressive attitude towards remote and flexible working. The culture and focus is very much on getting the job done well in a timely manner, more than exactly how it's done or FaceTime in the office. 
Next, time in meetings. In November, I spent 8.8 .8 hours in meetings, December 25.5 hours, January 35.5 hours, and February 9.8 hours so far at the point of making this video. Finally, over the month of January, I had 10.3 hours of one-to-one -one meetings and 25.3 hours in larger group meetings. Now, you've probably picked up that there's a significant amount of time here that's not been accounted for. So what happens during this time? Well, during this time, I undertake and complete tasks some of which are to do with the meetings I've discussed, and some are to do with other key projects. And of course, some of this unaccounted time is used for team building and personal development, which is very much encouraged at Docla. Let's now take a deep dive into what meetings I have and tasks that I undertake, starting with meetings. The meetings in my schedule can be broken down into two broad categories internal and external. Let's look at external first. The external meetings are the ones that are client facing and involves discussion with various key stakeholders, mostly from the client side, and sometimes also including key individuals from my company side. My role in these meetings differ based on the ownership of the meeting. For example, if I've called the meeting and therefore own it, then my role is to act as chair of the meeting who sets the agenda, invites the right people, and facilitates the most productive and efficient flow of discussion to arrive at the best outcomes, ultimately to improve patient care. An example of this type of meeting is our weekly project meeting that I run where we discuss the client's current utilization, future pathways, changes, and learnings to improve the service. In other cases, the meeting may be owned by someone else in my company. For example, clinical governance meetings, where we discuss monthly clinical learnings and is owned by the clinical team within my company. Here, my role is to answer questions related to any clinical incidents that I've helped to resolve. Alternatively, the meeting may be owned entirely by the client. For example, the monthly ICB project meetings, where the client discusses our service with their top executives to review and improve their utilization to improve patient outcome. Here, my role is to listen, learn, and contribute to the discussions by answering questions pertinent to my company, track future projects that may be discussed, and also to align on expectations. Next, some external meetings are actually training or demos of our product. This is owned by me, and my role is to arrange the session, demo Docla as a product and service using an example patient journey, and train clinical users on how to use our system. Lastly, for the external meetings, most are often quite collaborative where ownership is less important. An example of this are the clinical pathway meetings, such as frailty and heart failure, where the meeting is technically owned by the client's project manager, but my role is to work collaboratively with the client's clinical team to design and implement a successful clinical pathway. Now, let's look at internal meetings. The internal meetings are the ones that are within my company and cuts across lots of different departments for lots of different purposes. These meetings can be subdivided into five types. First, we have sync or prep. This is where myself and a few other members of the team meet together to sync or share our learnings and knowledge from meetings that we've had in the past week. We then use the shared knowledge to prepare for a future meeting or complete a task together. Next, we have internal project. In these meetings, we discuss an internal facing project, for example, increasing operational efficiency through the use of AI. In initial meetings, we scope the project, define the must-haves, the won't-haves, and the nice-to-haves, and then delegate to the correct team members with the right skill set to complete the tasks and push the project forward. Moving on, we have one-to-one -one development. Here, we meet one one-to-one -one with a line manager, i.e. someone we directly report to, in order to set professional development goals and carry out work reviews. Or in other one-to-ones, we meet with a buddy, who could be absolutely anyone in the company, but often is someone either a little bit ahead of you or a little bit behind you in terms of experience, so that we can learn and develop together. Next group review. In this meeting, all members of the team, for example delivery, would meet together to discuss progress, roadblocks and future goals. And finally, company alignment. This is where absolutely the whole company comes together to get weekly updates on the progress made by all the cogs in the business. It's also a space for us to bring questions to teams and execs that we may not work with day to day. We often start these meetings with a patient story to keep us grounded and aware of who's at the end of our product and service as well as motivated as we get to see our impact. A final example of this type of meeting is the Founders Coffee, which again is a nice feature of Docklist company culture, as the founders free up time to take any questions from absolutely anyone in the company. It also lets us get to know them as people, helping to create a much flatter hierarchy than in other companies. Next, let's look at tasks. Now, the majority of my work time is spent doing tasks, which fall within two buckets, admin tasks 
and strategy tasks. Let me explain. Admin tasks, as the name suggests, are the less glamorous of the two and can be further broken down into meeting related tasks and document design. Meeting related tasks include preparing for all of the meetings that I've discussed so far and also undertaking any fallout tasks generated from the discussions in the meeting. Preparation involves setting and circulating the agenda, collecting relevant data, constructing slide decks and reviewing past minutes. Whilst fallout tasks involve acting on decisions made within the meetings as well as getting new data data points and information to answer a client's request or questions. The other group of admin tasks is document design, where I create and edit information governance documents such as the DPIA or data protection impact assessment, as well as other more operational documents that outline standard operating procedures and clinical pathways. Next, the strategy tasks. The strategy tasks are certainly the more exciting of the two buckets and are quite diverse. Broadly, I group them further into three more buckets, operational efficiency, internal collaboration, and client engagement. Without going into too much detail and revealing commercially sensitive information, I've led projects and undertaken tasks such as video creation, editing, web design, running workshops, drop-in sessions, and leading multifaceted marketing campaigns. I've been very fortunate to have received a diagonal promotion quite early on within my career at Doppler. This has allowed me to work with cross-functional teams and leaders from all aspects of the business, including commercial, product, tech, and clinical. As part of this, I frequently have direct dialogue with C-suite executives, including the CEO and co-founders. This internal move has also allowed me to lead exciting projects designed to scale the business. Finally, it's also given me the ability to develop proficiencies in lots of diverse tools, which brings us nicely to the next point, tools. As a health tech company, patients are at the heart of Doppler. But of course, this is made possible by the tech, tools, and people of Doppler. Here, I'll briefly run through some tech and tools that I use on a daily basis. Again, not revealing too much, but giving you enough detail to identify what areas to develop proficiencies in. We use Slack primarily for internal communication and Confluence for sharing and storing internal information. Think Notion, but on a bigger scale and much more powerful. We use Jira and Radar for project management and incident reporting. Google apps such as Google Drive, Calendar and Mail are the preferred suites for document design, storage, organizing meeting, and sending non-NHS email. We also use OpenAI's ChatGPT Enterprise in increasingly powerful ways to boost our productivity. Finally, for software tools, I specifically use Final Cut Pro X and Motion for video projects, which are then hosted on Vimeo. In terms of hardware, we're provided an M2 MacBook Air, as well as some accessories to get a setup for comfortable home working. Truly a world away from the tired Lenovo ThinkPad PC that was still putting a shift in in my old doctor's office. Next, socials, perks, and play. Socially speaking, there's a huge bonus to work at a multi-million tech company as opposed to the NHS. Here at Doppler, we have quarterly company retreats, including one where we went to Lisbon, as well as bi-weekly pub outings and monthly team bonding, such as trips to Crystal Maze. And instead of having a slightly sorry for itself turkey-based Xmas dinner, for our Christmas party, we went to Winter Wonderland, followed by a seven course meal at a fantastic Japanese restaurant. Truly fabulous vibes. In terms of perks, as I've already mentioned, you get some very cool kits such as MacBooks, accessories and stash like bottles, backpacks, hoodies, etc. We also get to deliver our lunches whenever we're at the swanky London offices where glass doors, sofas, table tennis, gym and barista coffees greet us. On top of all this, we get a monthly hacker wellbeing budget that allows us to pay for things like gym membership, spa days, Fitbits, and even enormous plants. Finally, I promised I'd discuss reward and remuneration. For contractual reasons, I can't reveal my exact salary, but I can say this. I'm now earning more than my previous salary as a SC2 pathology specialty doctor, but less than what a first year medical consultant would be making. A fairly coy discussion, I know, but hopefully enough information to give you perspective on what to expect from tech. Now, if you're watching this and you're thinking to yourself, yep, yeah, I'm sold, how do I get in? Then you might like to watch this video where I talk about how I wrote the cover letter that got me into this multi-million tech company. But that's it for me for today. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you again next time.